what is your process and just pour yourself into that and next thing you know it's like there's just like there's no there's no you there yeah. right and yet and yet it's in that state that the full you is actually showing up it's a fascinating thing how that works yeah. the full like it's like we have to think about me in the thing in order to feel like we're doing it yeah. and it's stupid this is Way of the Artist with Brandon Colby Cook and Evan Schulte. Exploring the challenges of the creative call so that you can claim your own path and make your life a work of art. All right, we're starting. We're starting the podcast. <laughs> Think of that. All right, everybody, we're calling this one when there's no room to think. When there's no room to think, what happens? And I believe that we're making a case for this in this one <laughs> about, about what, what happens. And, and our chat before we started recording, we definitely talked a lot about you know, artistic related stuff, talked a lot about acting as a specific example of, of how this sort of plays out and the problems that thinking gets us into, particularly within, well, I don't know. One thing that came up that we talked about, which I think I, I'm very much want to make sure we talk about in relationship to this is with confidence. This, I mean, the issue of confidence is something that most of us deal with, right? Feeling confident. I don't feel confident, you know, and it can fluctuations in, in between that. And interestingly enough, there's something that can happen when you don't think where confidence becomes the question of confidence becomes irrelevant. It becomes, it becomes a non-factor in whatever it is that you're doing. And this has a lot to do with presence, which is one of our artist laws. It has a lot to do with process, which is another one of our artist laws as well. I'm sure it has to do with a few other things there as well. But there's a tremendous amount of value in learning to just step away from the old noggin <laughs> from having the command center, which is typically where, where a lot of us operate from. So I'm just going to leave it there. It's kind of leaving it in a bit of a, I don't know, mysterious space, I suppose, but I want to hand it over to you, Brandon, and, and see what you have to say to start this one off. Yeah. Confidence. Well, I always think of confidence now as trust. So when people say I don't feel confident, I'm always thinking, well, you don't, you don't feel like you can trust something, maybe yourself, maybe something else, but it's, you know, there's an element of, of trust that is not, that's not feeling secure, you know, is another element of it. I think, uh, I think there's a certain there's a certain point for artists and anybody doing sports or anything where you kind of have to go like, well, it, it it's like I just have something I got to do, you know. And so it, how you feel about it becomes more irrelevant. And I think there's something about that we're talking about. I think one of the interesting things that I remember I shared last podcast I shared a bit about like my journey as a soccer player and being kind of like the worst on the team and, and that type of thing. And, uh, one thing with that was when you're, um, when you're lower on the team, but you kind of know you're not the best on the team, there's a certain amount of, okay, I just gotta, I gotta, I gotta learn what they're doing. I gotta figure this out. I gotta, you know, and so the, everything is about growth. So there's a certain amount of, you're not trying to prove anything 
about yourself that isn't true. You like the only things you're trying to prove is like how well you can show up. Because when like f- for me at least, playing with players that were like so much, they were so good and so much better than I was. You know, I wasn't gonna convince them I was a good player by being an image of a good player. There's no way it was gonna happen. The only way I was gonna show up and convince them that I was a good player was to play well and to do good things and. Um, you know, that just started with make a good pass, you know, uh, get in the right position, do these little things. And then you start doing these little things. And then after a while, you just know to do those things. You don't think about them anymore. And, you know, you, you, you might look confident in a certain sense, but it's partly just because, you know, you have these practices that are good and you know what to do. Um, we used to have, occasionally we would have players come and try out for our team I remember this one player that came out. I don't remember who he was or anything, but I remember he came out mid-season to come try out for us. And I wasn't sure entirely the situation, but he was trying out and this kid was like, and it's it's a kind of an ugly term, but it gets thrown around a fair amount in sports and all like the team was like, uh, he's a tryhard. And th- the reason why they were saying he's a tryhard is because instead of just playing the game he was trying to make himself look good and it just looked really bad it looked really false um and i'll share another story like that kid obviously didn't make the team like because he wasn't fooling anybody he was trying to look like what a good player looks like instead of just doing what a good player does and at that point when he had come out to try out for the team i had already gotten to a point where i had learned certain things that that I just did as a practice as opposed to, or discipline. Whereas I could see that like he was trying to show them. Right. And it's like, you don't need to show that. Like don't show your work essentially. Right. Another thing I had, a, I had a really good friend uh, who, you know, he came on to that team second season and then, you know, he, he barely made the team. Uh, I had barely made the team second season. We were both kind of like, you know, bottom ringers on this squad which is part of the reason why we probably became friends. <laughs> and we both improved dramatically over the coming years. But I remember uh, we played for the same team for a while. And then I remember at one point, like later, this is years later, he, he went off to a different team. I went off to a different team. And then I remember him, our teams had to play or something like that. And I remember watching him play in this game. And this was like uh, six months later after we hadn't played together, maybe a year later. And he played with such grace. Like it was, it was incredible. It was like, it was so impressive. I don't know how to explain it, but like his, his, the best way I can kind of talk about it is like his stride was like so smooth and like a gazelle almost. And just like this kind of, just this trust with like the ball. And like he, you could see that he had built disciplines and I watched him like beat some of our players and like make some really good plays and stuff like that. And this guy was a very close friend of mine. So, you know, to see him from almost from a distance to not be on the team, but just kind of almost admire. I remember it, it made me realize I'm like, wow, you know, I've improved a lot, but my game's a little clunky, like compared to what he's doing now, like with this grace, with this movement, I'm like, and what I started to notice is like, there's a, there was a trust there was like a, there was a kind of, um, he, like when he was doing a, when he was, when he was doing something, he was really waiting to the last minute to make the decision on, okay, am I doing this or am I doing that? And he was really kind of responding to the game more. And it, it looks like grace. It just looks smooth. It looks, everything looks so like, like it just fits. Like it's, 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 it's a hard thing. But when someone's thinking a little bit, which I probably was a little bit too much at that point in, in my career, still trying to you know think about what I do too much. I remember thinking, yeah, that's what kind of makes me a little bit clunky. Cause like I'm, I'm at certain times in the game, I'm letting myself get in my head about it. Like, what am I going to do? You know? And it's like, just wait till the moment, wait till you wait until the moment till you see what they're going to do. And you, and there's this game that starts to happen, especially for forwards where you wait and 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 you you kind of wait right till they make their move. It's like, you're almost like playing chicken. And then right when they make their move, then you, then you decide. And you have to have this kind of like this, this pinpoint confidence where you're just like, I'm going to be okay. Cause the moment I see them do this one thing, I'm going to do the next thing. And the, the more you can play that game of chicken, the more cool shit happens. Right. But 
you have to trust that you're going to catch that moment of reaction. But it's all about like watching, paying attention, being present. So I feel like um, a lot of what we're talking about is definitely about process, but definitely also about presence and how that relates to confidence and not thinking. So that's the best I can input for now. Well, that's pretty good input in my mind. Yeah, this, you know, the I like that you brought trust as an element, as a different way of thinking about what confidence is, because I think that sometimes, sometimes confidence feels like it's this thing that we've got to drum up somehow, that we've got to, you know, it's it's like this elusive figure that exists some somewhere that we can't exactly find every now and then, but trust has a different feel to it. You know, and, and I think that you're absolutely right. Like it's, it's when we're, when we don't feel confident, there's behind it is there's a lack of, of trust. Right. And I think that what comes to mind is, well, trust the process. You know, how many times have, I mean, I'll just speak for myself. How many times have I heard that, you know, not only just in my own life, but in other contexts about other things, but just like trust the process, trust the process, right? And I think that we sometimes have such a hard time, such a hard time doing that because we can get so wrapped up in wanting certain results, uh, sometimes just impatience, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And, and also through the process, there's like, well, what am I going to look foolish in doing this? Am I going to look stupid? Like there's, there's a lot of ego that can end up funneling into, into that space as well. But again, all of this stuff is, is thinking related right? Like I don't feel confident uh, because I'm thinking about this, this, and this. I'm thinking about, about how I, you know, this is how this thing, this similar situation has panned out the last number of times, you know? And it's like, at, at the, the weird thing about that is like, well, yeah. And if you focus on that, if that's what you're putting your attention on, you're probably going to go there. It's like when you're driving or riding a bike, you know, or bicycle, whatever it is, like one of the things that, you know, you learn early on is pretty much wherever your, your eyes go, that's where you're going to go. Yeah. That's where you're going to end up. Even if walking, yeah. even if you're just walking down the street. If you, if you turn your head and you're, and you're looking in the completely opposite direction from where you're going, you're going to discover that you're walking, <laughs> you're suddenly, you're moving in that direction, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy in that situation and that's all thought mm -hmm. that's all just because you're thinking and it creates all of these problems whereas you know that whole there's great wisdom in trust the process right trust the process which is saying like look focus on the process of what you're doing just focus on on that thing mm -hmm. and this is a big part of i think the conversation that we're in, and it has a lot to do with presence like you're saying but, you know, one of the things that I learned through at some point eventually <laughs> in my actor training, and it's something that I've always been teaching now, but now I'm like, <laughs> just with this conversation that we're having, like, I need to, I need to emphasize this even more as one of the biggest pieces of advice I could give any actor. And I'm sure this applies in other areas too, but just like take the attention off of yourself, mm -hmm. take the attention off of yourself. That's the, one of the biggest pieces of advice I could give. Get, just, just stop thinking about yourself, put your, and your attention over there. What are the other things? Put your attention on the other person, put your attention on what's just happening right now, put your attention on, you know, like just anything but you just because once that happens, it's a spiral yeah. of things where it's like, you're just, you're so, you, you become so self-consumed. It creates like a black hole that just sucks creativity away. Mm 
you know, and it sucks your creativity. It sucks your presence away. Whereas when you put the focus on something else other than yourself, suddenly there's this vitality and this energy and this responsiveness that you have that is extraordinarily intelligent, right? Which involves, like, it, it doesn't mean that your thinking has gone, right? But it, it's more like it's now in its proper place, right? But there's actually your full, your full human intelligence is, is now in effect when you take the attention off of yourself. It's a kind of a fascinating thing how that happens. That takes a great deal of trust, <laughs> you know, that, that that's going to happen. And I think that's a, that's a huge challenge for sure, because it means a certain giving up of control. And that's, that's a big part of it as well. Like the thinking mind is the one that also wants to be in control of things. I don't know if I have anywhere else that I'm going with this, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. You got something <laughs> to jump off there? I'll, I'll add something to that. It, one of the things is that you're not in as much control as you think you are. That's the first thing I would point out. Um, there's a illusion of control. And, the, and if you do think you're in control of yourself, if you really do, if you're convinced, you're like, no, I am. It means your world's really, really small. It's, it only works that way. Like basically the bigger your world is, the more you realize you're out of control. So people can keep themselves really, really small and feel this sense of control, but it's because it's just you, yourself, and I. It's like you, you, you have no interactions in the outside world. You have nothing to challenge you. You have nothing, and your life will be very small and probably kind of depressing, honestly. But if you, the moment you make yourself big and you begin to lead, you begin to have a vision, you begin to do anything like this, you begin to go try something that you, you aren't the dictator of, so to speak, you're going to be out of control. And you try and control that, and you're going to look more and more like an idiot because... You just look like a little child that's trying to to steer a car that they're not driving. It's like someone gave you a toy steering wheel. You just look like a fool, you know? And the thing is, is that um, when you realize this, there's a kind of humility in it and there's a fun in it. It's like where it's like, but it's not that you're not in control. So you're, it's more like you're a surfer on a wave. It's like, you don't get to control the wave. You don't get to control the height of the wave. You don't get to control any of that, but you do get to manage how you're going to ride it. So yeah. There's a certain amount of uh, control what you can, which is very little, but understand that there's a nature behind things that you have no real say over. And if you try to deny the nature, the nature will slam you. And if you, um, you know, if you act like you aren't using the nature, you'll look foolish because, you know, it's so evident that you're not it. Like you're not the thing that's moving the thing and you... You know, it just looks, it looks out of place. It doesn't look right. Uh, another thing that you, just about what you're talking about. So I was thinking about um, past data, how we use past data to justify confidence. And it's such a bullshit measurement. So first of all, yeah, yeah first of all, if you're learning something, maybe it takes you 10 times to do it before you get it right. And so let's say you failed at it nine times before you did it the one time right. You could make the argument. It's like, I always fail at this. Yeah, but you could have failed at it nine times, succeeded once, and then the next 10 times you do it, you could have succeeded 10 times. But because you decided before you hit the first time you did it right, or maybe you only did it right once or something, and then you made a mistake again, whatever, now you've created this story narrative based on your past about how you always fail and you're never lucky. That's bullshit. That's not real. Then none of that happened. The thing is, is that um, justifying who you are in your present moment based on past results has a place every now and then, but it's not when it comes to the realm of confidence. It's not. In fact, anything, you should be more confident. The, you should have more confidence the more you failed than, the, than when you succeeded. Because every time you failed, you learned what went wrong. You had a chance to learn what went wrong. And a, and a master is somebody that, that knows all the ways things can go wrong. And that's what helps them to get it right over and over and over again. The person that just keeps getting it right, they're more of a liability because when they don't know what can go wrong, they can be careless. They can be reckless. They can do a lot of stuff. You know, look at youth, right? Youth's a great example of that. They haven't had a moment of, you know, uh, a lot of the time of, of having something go wrong. So they have a fearlessness seeming, a confidence, right? 
but it's reckless. A lot of youthful people are very reckless. Whereas when you get older and then you go do something that's a little bit more courageous, it's, and you've actually had a few bumps and bruises, you have the context of knowing, okay, I know what could go wrong. So when you do it, you do it more mindfully. And maybe you don't do it as boldly as someone who does it youthfully or who is youth, youthful when they do it. But the thing is, is that's, they might be being reckless. And sometimes I think we look at confidence like the, whoever swings harder, whoever goes bigger is the one that's more confident. It's not necessarily true. Um, you know, there's a, I, I think, you know, there's a, there's a saying like, you know, you jump enough holes, you eventually fall in one, right? And just because somebody seems to be jumping a bunch of holes and actually accomplishing the goal doesn't mean that they're not going to, they're not going to fall in one. And so whatever mistakes you make along the way, you should go, good. I'm glad I made this mistake. I just learned this. Oh, good. I'm glad I made this mistake. I just learned this. I'm more prepared. I'm better set. I'm, I'm better to go. And we, but we have a mentality of looking at confidence, like what's my success rate, you know? And I would argue that success rate is not always a good tell, you know? And, and, uh, one last thought on that. I remember there's this friend of mine, uh, more of an acquaintance now, but I remember him pointing out these, he, he was saying, talking about baseball. And he said, you know what's so interesting about baseball? He's like, it's often the players who, when they were younger, were not the stars that ended up making it. And it was the ones who were like the stars that never went anywhere. And he said, and he was, he was making an argument with me. He's like, I think why that is, is because people who, when you're not kind of considered this, like, although there's exceptions, don't get me wrong. But like, he was like, when you're not considered like the special talent, you have to work so hard. And so you develop the skills that a lot of these other players don't, don't develop. And he's like, it's just an interesting thing that tends to occur. And I think there's a, there probably is some parallels to that. It's like, when you, when you believe your own hype, you might feel good and that might feel confident, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're good. And I think that if you're not feeling confident, I don't think you should, you should make that also mean you're not good. I think sometimes you just need to be like, you know, part of my lack of confidence is an opportunity to learn. And through learning, you'll find confidence. But I think if you just want to be like blessed with confidence, and I think a lot of people do, I think we all kind of do in a certain way, but I don't think we really know what we're asking for. So yeah. So anyway, my, my point, I'll just kind of summarize it again. I don't think your past events, your past data, your past mistakes have anything to do with your present moment. And I don't think, well, not sometimes they do. Sometimes there's cases where that matters, but when it comes to matters of confidence, I don't think we should use that as a, as a way to determine how confident you are because you can literally start over again every moment. But, you know, will you give yourself that grace, that opportunity? Because like you're not tied to your past, you know? And in fact, all your pasts are just lessons. So if anything, you usually learn your best lessons from your failures. Yeah, because I mean, you can you can fail after you've succeeded and you can succeed after you've failed. Like yeah. it's, and there's, for some reason, golf came to my mind, you know, because golf is one of those, one of, the, for anyone who's ever played it, and but for anyone who hasn't, like there's, it is one of the most humbling games that a person can, that I think is out there and you can you know it, it's fascinating there's a great Netflix documentary out there called the full swing that talks about pro golfers and just you know how much of of that of that sport is is mental you know like it's the the best still have days where they just really eat shit <laughs> and what do you do you well, you put your attention back on your process. That's so much like that's the level and the the best people, not just in sports, but in, in the arts too. Like I think that the best are always focused on the process of what they're doing because there's already so much there for you to put your attention onto. And, and what it does in terms of confidence, again, I'll, I'll bring this back in here, is that when you're when that's what your focus is on is in the process, which is again, you're you're taking you're taking the attention off of yourself, right? Because when you're focused on the process, you're 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 in a state of responding to what is needed, to to what arises, right? And to me, that's 
putting yourself in the position to respond is, is really, is really where you actually put yourself in a position of the most control, mm. right? Which is not being able to like stranglehold something, but it's actually a position of readiness and, mm. and, and openness. Like you're, you're on your, like you're bouncing, you're on your toes. Like you can, you're like, okay, what's coming, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm ready and I'm just ready to respond. And that's what the best in their fields, I think, do. Like they're, they don't necessarily, they're not, ex they, they've thrown out what they think is going to happen, you know, like to a certain degree. And, and they're not trying to, to predict what's about to happen. They're, they're paying attention right for the signal and sometimes the signal that they get tells them what's about to happen right but that 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 kind of focus and putting your focus in that place removes to me the whole the the whole problem of confident and not confident because again that's a feeling and feelings come and go right but when you put your attention on process you're just doing you're just like there's no room for for that to even come in mm -hmm. to to whatever it is that you're doing because you're so focused on okay am i in am i in my position yeah. am i in position really you know like it's and that applies in sports but that also in art for sure that that's there right like as an actor you know, there's the time that I have when, yeah, I'm, I am exploring elements of the character. I'm, I'm doing some sleuthing and, and investigation and, and figuring out where they're coming from, like connecting to, you know, what their story is and finding that, that compassion and, and understanding of the character. And that's, that's a thing that I do at a certain time, right? But when I show up to perform, when I'm showing up to do that thing, this is the position I need to be in. Mm. I, need, I, I can't be doing that position because that position is for over there. Right. Here I need to be in this position, right? Knowing, knowing what to do when is, you know, and some of that comes with experience, but that's also part of process and, and just focusing on process. Okay, okay, here I need to do this. I need to just make sure I am listening. Mm right? Or at this moment, it's like, okay, I need to, I need to focus on the thing that gets me emotionally alive as I walk into the scene. But once I've, I'm finished with that position, I'm moving into this position, yeah. right? But it's just that, that capacity to, to respond and putting yourself in that, in that position to me. And, and again, that comes with process that doesn't have to, that, that doesn't have to come with you know, it, it's that thing of, of thinking that we have to feel a certain way in order to perform, right? And that's, and that's a story. And again, yeah. that's, that's, that's just another concept. That's just another product of, of thinking. Mm -hmm. That's saying is like, oh, I, unless I'm feeling this way, I won't be performing well. Right. And it's like, says who? Yeah. Says who? I've had days where I've thought that I've done absolute shit, but then someone's like, oh, this is really great. You know, and I go, oh, okay. Like I wasn't feeling great, but very often, which, which without me necessarily understanding it at the time, is I'm just having this sort of realization now, but my attention was going on to my process. And what I was doing whenever I've had those kinds of moments where I've just been like, okay, I'm not feeling this way, but all right, I'm going to put my attention over there on my scene partner, right? I'm going to just put my attention. I'm just going to really work at listening to what they're saying. I'm going to really try and make sure that I'm, I'm not forcing anything, right? I'm going to try and relax my body. I'm going to try and, you know, just do these things that that again are putting me in that position to just be as responsive as possible to the moment. Mm -hmm. And how I feel about it after the fact is kind of irrelevant to a certain degree, like because 
because you might have ended up doing something fantastic, right? Because, and, and very often when you think you're doing, when you're not feeling good, and because it can lead to you just really putting more attention on your process, it can, it can yield such incredible results mm -hmm. that if you're feeling great, you might just, like, don't get me wrong. It's always better when you feel, when you're feeling good too, while you're, you know, still focused on that process, because there can be a kind of relaxation that comes with that, mm -hmm. which is, you know, that's a whole other thing. But, but when you're, when you're in that position of relaxed, it, it does add to that element of readiness and openness, but we're not always in that place. Mm -hmm. We're not always in that place. So again, the best thing that you can do is just take the attention off of yourself. Like instead of going down the rabbit holes of why you suck or why you don't feel like, you know, like that, that's just going to sap your energy when you could just be putting that energy into this thing. And then where that feeling becomes almost a non-factor in what you're doing. Well, there's, yeah, there's some interesting stuff you brought in there. I think, uh, sometimes when you don't feel good or you're feeling tired, or you're feeling sick, sometimes it takes away a lot of defense mechanisms and that can, that can work out for you. Um, I, I, you know, I, I know that you didn't mean it necessarily this way, but you, you said, uh, it, it, it's always better when you feel good. But I think what you mean is it's, it's always a better state to be in feeling good than it is a state to be in not feeling good, but it doesn't necessarily mean better work. Cause like there's this plenty of time where I've been writing a screenplay or writing something that I'm doing and you know, I'm not inspired. I'm not any of that. And I don't even want to write, but like maybe there's some anger or something going on or some sadness. And then, you know, and that informs the work and then this really cool stuff comes out that, you know, I didn't expect. And so one of the things that I learned very early on was that you should, whatever feeling you have that's going on, if it's what you got, when you walk on stage or when you show up or when you're about to do whatever you're about to do and it's just there, you should use it. You should work with that one because that's the one you got. And I mean, I do think as you become, you know, maybe you become a little like, maybe it's not always like this, but I do think as you become a little bit more capable, a little more skilled, um, you can begin to have better state control. You can have a better way of kind of accessing your emotions and shifting from one to the next. And, you know, being in touch with yourself so you don't feel so victimy to your emotions. Cause I think that's one of the things that early on when you haven't really figured out how to navigate your emotions, especially if you blocked a lot of them, they can feel overwhelming and you don't know what to do with them. And you can feel thrown off because an emotion's coming up, but you know, whatever emotion, what I've learned is like whatever emotion you have, it's usually trying to tell some truth. So you should always just listen to the truth it's trying to tell. And often once its truth gets told, it'll move along and, and be gone. And uh, it's when you refuse to tell its truth. It's when you deny it. It's when you resist it. Uh, you know, there's a, I was thinking about a, there was a period of time where I was working with these two acting teachers that were working kind of in coordin coordination with each other. And I had to do this scene and uh, I did the scene and I felt terrible, but I was like, oh man, I just feel like I didn't really put as much work as I should have into it. And, you know, and uh, it was taped and everything. And then um, the one teacher and everybody, I, everyone seemed to like it. I don't know, whatever I didn't, but then the one teacher went to my other teacher and they were like, yeah, Brandon did a really great job in class this week or whatever. And then my other teacher came to me and he goes, yeah, um, they said, you did a really great job in class today. And I was like, I just, you know, I didn't feel like I did my, my work enough. Like, and I kind of like defeated myself and he's like, oh, he's like, well, make sure you do your work. But like, it's good to know that when you're not really feeling like you're doing your work, it's still really good. And, and people are obviously like it. So that's a good sign. I was like, oh yeah. And you know, later I watched on video. I'm like, what was I thinking? This is really good. This is actually some, some really good work. But it was all my, my interpretation of whether the work was good was just because of the way I felt and what I was thinking about myself. But when I look back at it, it was like very present, it was in the moment, I was dealing with what I was dealing with. And in some ways, it, in a way, because it was honest, it informed the character, you know? Um, and, you know, who knows? Yeah, I don't know, man. It's a weird one, right? It's like, so this is the thing about confidence is like, uh, one thing I, I try to remember is like, 
when you've worked at something and you've put you've put effort into it and you and you you have a sense that you you have something to say or you know what you're doing to some degree you have to trust that you can you know you can do it you can do it you know you can do what you can do and often that's what is good like i think when things are too tidy when they're too well put together sometimes they're bad because you know you don't like i think particularly with with elements of art and relationships you don't know you don't know what you what you think you know based on your perception alone um i'm reading a book right now i think it's called the laws of attraction or something like that there's an interesting couple chapters in the book i'll just share them real quickly because i think they're interesting in one chapter it's like so the chapters shift from one character to the next character to another character and there's several characters and it just sw- switches so you get their different perspectives and in this one chapter you got this one character and he's talking about how great this interaction went and how blah, 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 this is so good. And then it cuts to the other character in the next chapter. And that person has an entirely different perception of the whole interaction they had. And they're like, oh, this guy was an idiot. He was super drunk and whatever. And it was like really funny to kind of read these back to back because it's like, yeah, like one person, and, and this book does that several times in a bunch of scenarios, but it's like, just because something feels good for you, just because you think it's good, doesn't mean it is. Doesn't mean that it's working. And sometimes you think, man, I totally fucked everything up. I'm messing everything up. And that's why it's working so well because there's kind of a, there's there's a, a lack of trying. There's a lack of overcompensation maybe, you know, or like you're just in it, right? And yeah, I mean, the, the, my point is, is that you don't know as much as you think you know. So the best thing to do, the only thing you do know is that you have this moment and that's what you have. And what everyone else thinks about it and their opinions of it is kind of irrelevant, but you can tell your truth in your moment and don't try to judge whether it was good or not based on what other people think of it um, or what you think, you no, know, rather what you think other people think of it, you know, like, and sometimes even what they think of it because sometimes people don't know. Anyway, I'm going to pass it to you. Yeah, there's, there is this trap that it seems that can come with also just that feeling confident that can, that can make you, that can actually drop you out of that, that open responsive state as well, Mm -hmm. right? Because you're just feeling similar to, to when you're not feeling good, right? Like, because both times you can you you can just be thinking about yourself, right? Just in a different spectrum, right? Where you're just like, it's like, oh yeah, I'm crushing it right now. I'm feeling, you know, like it's, it's, and that's just attention to being on yourself again, right? Same th- thing with the negative. It's just like, oh, I'm doing shit. You know, what am I even, you know, like that whole time when you're, when you're in that space is all just energy that you're not putting into being focused on on whatever the present thing that is happening, right? So they can, yeah, they can both do something really bad, but they can also contribute something as well, right? Because yeah, there can be, when you're in that positive state, it can lend a certain kind of relaxation and ease to what you're doing. But there's also, on the opposite side of it, there can be an interesting tension that, can come into into it as well right that especially within acting i know this to be true like it's you never know what the audience is picking up on right and they're having a whole like as you're saying from this book that you're reading you have no idea how how they're taking that and, and interpreting it but when you're again when you're focused on on the process of what you're doing you are you are keeping yourself in that lane like you're keeping yourself in that lane of 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 i don't know truth honesty i don't know exactly how to how to put it in as far as the artistic lens is is concerned but you're it's the thing that just keeps you in the right lane Mm -hmm. as you're as you're moving forward and there's something else that i wanted to say just in terms of 
Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. I, what came to mind was the most recent Thor movie, which, you know, I don't like to shit on movies, but it was pretty terrible. <laughs> and most people kind of agreed with that as well. I don't think I'm saying like even even and this is what I wanted to bring up, actually, was, you know, even Chris Hemsworth was has not so subtly alluded to the fact that, yeah, no, this was not a very good movie. <laughs> And he made some comment to, to the effect of, yeah, I think that we were all having a little bit too much fun there. So it sounded like everybody was having a good time. Right. Everyone was feeling good. Everyone was having fun. But through that, that thing, it was just like, hang on a second. What is this story that we're telling? Yeah. What is this story about? What is the emotional, like, where's the weight of this story? Because it's like, it can't just be goofing off and dicking around like this is like there's got to be there's got to be a story here that touches people you know what is that thing right and it it seemed like there was a kind of a confirmation that yeah we we sort of lost lost sight of the point <laughs> to a certain degree the the process got lost mm -hmm. in what they were doing that the, they weren't putting the the thing that needed to be put into it in, into their attention that was not where, where the attention was going Right. It was about the attention was all going into like being silly and funny and goofy and cracking jokes and that it was like the whole thing, the whole movie just started to feel like a, it all just started to feel like a laugh, right. you know, like it was it's like, yeah, but where's the, why do I care about this? Yeah. You know, like, why do I care about this story? And so that I'm just bringing that up as an example of like, yeah, sometimes feeling good is not the good metric creatively mm -hmm. in, in this whole thing. Um, just the, the same way as, as feeling bad is not necessarily the right, the right metric, but ultimately it's, it's, yeah, I keep coming back to this thing. I'm just like, you've got to take the attention off of yourself. Like the more you take the attention off of yourself and into what you're doing, which is essentially no, no, not giving yourself the room to think, which is where we started off yeah. with this thing, because our thinking so often becomes like so self-involved, right? And it's just like, it just becomes about, about me, 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 me. And, and the story that I'm, the stories that I'm telling myself and all of my baggage and all of my shit and, and yada, yada, yada. And by again, taking your attention and saying, okay, well, what is the thing that I can actually put this into? Or right? what can I actually put my focus into in the thing that I'm doing? Just like, can we just stop thinking for a second about all of this that's going on in my head? Like, to a degree, accept it. Yeah, yeah, this stuff is all going on in my head. All right. That's just what's happening. That's just what's happening. I accept it. Now, what is my next step with this thing? Am I writing a, a screenplay? What scene am I on now? Right. Or maybe I'm just starting. What's the title? Maybe I just write the title at the top of this thing. Right. Just putting yourself focused onto that. Right. And remember, none of it is, none of it is set in stone. Yeah. None of it has to be set in stone, but just like what, what's just the thing right now. Okay. We're going to write that thing down. We're going to put this thing down. Right. Okay. Now what's the next thing? Right. Okay. All right. Let's develop this character a little bit more. Or maybe it's like, what, what, what happens at the end, by the end of the scene, what happens, you know, da, 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 I don't know. Like there could be just, what is your process? Mm -hmm. And just pour yourself into that. Next thing you know, it's like, there's just like, there's no, there's no you there. Yeah. Right. And yet, and yet it's in that state that the full you is actually showing up. It's a fascinating thing how that works. Yeah. The full, like, it's like we have to think about me in the thing in order to feel like we're doing it. Yeah. And it's stupid. Yeah. Like, it's a really stupid notion. It's like, I got to be working so hard thinking about how I am doing this thing. And it's just like, stop thinking about how you are doing this thing. It's just, I mean, getting kind of philosophical here, but it's like, there's just the thing. Like, and you're just a part of it. It's yeah. a sing, it's a single thing that's occurring because the, that script isn't writing itself, right? Like it's, it's, it, there's, there's a, a unified 
thing that is going on there, right? Just as you just being there doesn't doesn't create a script, right? Like there's that that's all a single process that's happening, right? So when you take yourself out of it, like the full you is there doing it, right? Even though it does, and, and I think we were talking about this before we started recording, and this was specifically with acting, but again, I think this translates to, you know, I've had these experiences doing other things like like playing guitar and writing scripts where there is that that flow state, right? Where there is no there is no feeling or thought of I am doing this. There's just this being done. Mm -hmm. And you're just you're so in it. You're so lost in it. But then an interesting thing can happen there is where suddenly you distrust that. Right. Like suddenly the I <laughs> interjects itself again into the into that moment. And it's just like, I don't feel like I'm doing anything at all right now. I don't feel like I'm working hard enough. I don't feel like this is all just, this is all just kind of spilling out right now. This is all just kind of happening. And I don't feel like I am really doing it. And it's like, guess what? That means that you're really doing it. Yeah. Like it's, it's great art. Great art feels effortless when, when you're doing it right. I remember that was one of my acting teachers, a great act. And he's like, great acting happens when it feels effortless. Like that's actually where you want, where you want it to be, but it can take some, it can take some reconditioning of ourselves, I guess, in order to, in order to actually trust that. Yeah. There, so well, there's a few things here. Hmm. Let me start with, uh, let me start with the thinking about things. I think there's this kind of, okay. So there's this quality of like, what are you thinking about when we're talking about thinking about things? Because we're really talking about you thinking about yourself, thinking about things. We're not we're actually talking about thinking about things. Like I think that's the thing. That's the real important kind of thing to, to, to make sure you decipher in this conversation, because it's not so much because you will, because you're like, wait a minute, I'm thinking it's like, well, that's not necessarily a problem. Like if you're thinking because you're focused on what you're doing. Yeah. Technically you're thinking, but you don't see, see yourself thinking it's like when you're it's when you're focused on yourself that becomes problematic it's like how do i look like if you have any questions like that or whatever i mean i'm not saying you shouldn't have a moment of like check in check ins are okay check ins are are kind of the exception to the rule but people check in that's a very natural thing where it's like you know um someone scratches their nose and you're in a deep conversation with them you might immediately think oh do i have something in my nose that is an okay thought to have. That's a fair thought to have. It's very, it means you're in rapport because he, because there's a communication that's happening between us that we're not, we're not always clear on what's happening. So if someone rubs their nose, they may just have an itchy nose, but they also might be signaling to us, hey, you got something in your nose, but they might be doing it a polite way. So we have all these things we're doing all the time. So sometimes when you have a moment of thinking about yourself, it doesn't mean that you're totally out of it. It, it actually might, mean that you're really connected you're actually really in rapport like particularly in acting if you notice that you are beginning to mimic when you're mimic things the other scene partner is doing you know and you're subconsciously but you catch yourself in the subconscious action of doing it that doesn't necessarily mean just because you caught yourself that oh i'm in my head again that doesn't that's that's a natural response but when you're trying to be like this will look good. This will look cool. This is how you do it. You know, that type of stuff. These things are definitely, you're not in it. You're, you're trying to put something on and it's problematic. Um, the same goes for writing. One of the things about like a lot of times writers will ask about dialogue and my rule with dialogue, at least on the first go through is just write it out. Don't, don't, try and think of anything crafty or like creative, like on, on how you're going to say it. Because like in a conversation, you don't really have time to, to stop and be like, Oh, I know I'll think about this. You know, now there's a little bit, you get a little bit of room to play with that. I mean, it's not, it's not as immediate as a conversation, but the more you stop, usually the worst your writing is going to get. And it's across the board. I see this all the time. And usually I, the, the funniest thing is, is that 
the writers that think they have written dialogue well and they took their time and they got all creative about it is usually not very good scene writing dialogue and stuff writing particularly but the the people who are like i don't know like i had to get the scene done and i just kind of punched it out and then all of a sudden like you look at their scene and you're like wow this is really good but it's like well i didn't even think about it what do you mean it's good it's like well because it moves along like someone's actually having a real conversation here so you know um this is one of those things it's like you know you got it in some ways it's not just there's no time to think. You got to give yourself no time to think. You got to set yourself up into a situation as it's like, okay, I just got to do this quick. And and by pushing yourself to not let yourself stop and like ponder about it is actually what's going to help you let something pour out of you and and not get filtered, right? Because I think the other thing too is, um, man, when you really are writing authentically, it's so vulnerable. Because you write it, and when you're writing it, you're not thinking about what you're putting on the page. But then later, when someone's going to read it, you're like, oh man, they're going to see what I wrote. It's a weird thing, because you're like, when you're really doing it, you're doing it almost as if no one else is ever going to read it. And then it isn't usually until after that you realize you shared something about yourself or the way you see things that you didn't realize you shared, but you shared it in the process. And that I find is kind of a a vulnerable experience but usually that's where the best writing happens you know one of my literary reviews of one of the scripts i did like I, i've shared this before but there was this one monologue mini monologue moment in the scene where this character goes off about like these um whatever he just goes off about these types of people and he's just like talking about his opinion of them <laughs> the literary was like that was inspired and i was like I was just talking about some assholes that I had met in my life, like, and just the, just the way they were and how, like, you know, and just my, my angst with them and like, you know, and kind of this, um, almost like I, I used the position of this character to kind of like, you know, speak my mind a little bit about, uh, you know, and, and it worked in context of the story, you know, but it just felt, it felt obviously real and true. And then some of the other stuff where I thought, oh, this is really good. And, you know, it's, it's coordinated. It's just not as authentic and raw. It doesn't have something about it. Uh, There's one other thing I was going to say. What is it? I don't know. Um, Yeah. You know, like, I mean, I think the thing is, is, you know, put your attention outward again and again and again i mean i think the, tr- the 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 way to get yourself to stop thinking is to not put your attention on yourself like the more you put your attention outward the the less you're going to find you get caught up in thinking because thinking if you look at a lot of your 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 destructive or say negative or like your thoughts that actually hold you back they somehow involve you and when you get focused on what you're doing what other people are doing, what you're up to, what you're building, what you're creating, like all these outward things. And you don't worry about how that looks about you and how that relates to you. You'll find that the thinking doesn't really get, it doesn't come into the picture. It's kind of more relevant. It's when you start getting this kind of self-conscious element. I think that's, that's where it all becomes problematic. So, um, you know, it's, a, uh, you know, I think as we are talking about this conversation, one of the things is, you you know, you want to get yourself into states of not being self-conscious. Um, one last note. I love motorcycle riding because with motorcycle riding, well, when you're doing it well, I suppose, you know, you can tune out, as, especially as you get more experienced. But what I have loved about it is that when you are in adventure riding in particular, where you're pushing yourself on new roads and you're going to new areas and you're exploring new stuff, I love it because it makes me so present. I'm, I'm constantly just looking. I got my eyes open. I'm, I'm ready. I'm in a state of readiness. I'm, I'm looking at all these details and I forget in a lot of ways about everything that's going on in my life. Not that I want to, but just, I do because I'm so present in the moment and I'll stop every now and go, man, that was fun. That was so much fun. And it's like, but yeah, because when you're present, it's, you're just alive. You're like in it. And 
when you start thinking, that's when you actually start drifting and that's when you start making mistakes on a motorcycle, right? And I do catch myself. Occasionally it happens. And then I kind of bring myself back and I snap back into it a little bit, but I'm like, oh, look at that. I just kind of drifted off a little bit there. I got a little comfortable. But um, something about motorcycle, because there's been kind of this, uh, it's been instilled in me that there's a danger that is involved with this. It it keeps bringing me back. It's like, oh, just remember, remember, you know, this, this could all end real badly real quick. Just remember, you know? And so that, that little bit of danger brings me right back to that moment. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and honestly, the only time I'm, my mind's really drifting is when I'm, when I'm doing something that's very, very easy and like unchallenging, but when I'm rounding a corner at a high speed, I can tell you, man, I'm probably more present than ever. I'm so in the pocket. So like focused and in line with what's happening because you know, that's not a moment to take casually. Right. And, and that's kind of, you know, that's where a lot of this stuff gets exciting. And I think that's a lot about what we're talking about. Yeah. I, I do have some things to add to what you're saying. (laughs) There was, you know, there was something in what you were saying at some point there. And I think it was in what you were saying about this, one of your scripts and this monologue that you wrote. And yeah, if you, if you start thinking your way through this stuff, you know, like that's, that's what's getting to run the show creatively. I mean, it's very hard for anything genuinely creative to happen because typically what happens is you try to get real clever about things. And that's once you start trying to get clever, that's, that's when you're in trouble. Cause that's like, that's all ego, yeah. you know, trying to be clever because that's all about appearing a certain way. Right. Like trying to, trying to be clever means like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to show myself in this kind of way to people. Right. And in this example, in the example that you gave about this monologue and that there was something that was behind it that was full of all of this other stuff, right. Which I will, I will also, I'll come back to this word intelligence. It came out of, an emotional intelligence. It came out of a, an intelligence of your heart, out of your guts, out of your soul, right? There's these other things that are at play here that are not just from your head. And that is in many ways more in touch with reality than our heads are. And I think that that's why it can be so powerful because we like to think that our our heads and our intellects are 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 in touch with reality but they're so often not you know as we've i think explored in many ways on this very episode like we can be telling ourselves all kinds of stories about how these things always happen even if that's not always the case like our minds deceive us all the time also thought is all based on concepts they're all ba- it's all based on abstractions which has an incredibly powerful utility in life but it it actually doesn't come in direct contact with reality mm-hmm. going to a, to a another kind of philosophical space but there is there is a it is true because the world of concepts is not the actual is never the actual thing. It's always a representation of the thing, right? Like the word, like I've brought this up in a, in another episode before, but the word, uh, the word water doesn't get you wet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that kind of encompasses this thing that I'm trying to express here. Just that like the word water is not, 
actually water. It's just a it's just a verbal representation of just like how thinking about the ocean doesn't get you wet, right? Like it's 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 not the real thing. But there's something about that that those other things that we can bring to the table when we again when we bring the the heart, the guts, the soul, the whatever you, however you want to kind of define that or word that those things are in touch with a reality at a closer level than thought is right which is why someone can someone can write a very clever monologue <laughs> and you can go and it's just like oh how clever that was but be completely unmoved by it be completely un unchanged by it right like it's kind of there and it's gone but then something someone can write a monologue in a play or a movie that's so deeply connected to something so real in that person something that they've lived through something that they've felt something that they still feel something that still tugs at their their heartstrings or punches them in the in the stomach whenever they relive it you know or or tell this thing and that that translates like that comes through right there's a quality to that that is kind of undeniable right but that only happens when when the thinking goes away and again or at least and not that the thinking goes away, but that it's put in its right place, right? When it's, and it's, and it becomes just part of the whole being and intelligence that is you is, is there, right? They're all, they're all working together. You know, it's like a, like a beautifully well, like designed car. All these, all these parts and pieces are all just doing the thing that they're supposed to be doing and it's all firing and it's, and it's like, boom, we're high performance now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Add something to that, Brandon. I'm just going to add one more thing and then maybe we'll, we'll share the beer and wrap her up. You're all right with that. Uh, unless something else comes up for you, but let, let me say, let me say this. It's, um, you know, I think there are, the, the one thing about the mind, as far as using it as some type of way to direct yourself with art and relationships, is it will always, it, want, it, it either is trying to feed the ego and be self-serving because it's like a very, it's, 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 like, it's like wired in a way to like, it's self-sustaining, self-surviving. It's like it has a, almost like a program in it to do that, right? So you'll find that you'll do things that'll try to be like, like what people, a lot of people wouldn't think of it this way, but trying to look cool is a survival mechanism. It's basically, you think that you can, you, you know, you think that you can kind of get something that'll help your survival, that will help your position, that will help your status, whatever. And so, but the problem is, is that the moment we catch wind of that, we don't like we don't like it at all. And you actually end up getting the opposite of what you were looking for. So that, so you have to, you have to be deceptive if you're going to do it that way. And the problem with being deceptive is that deceptive always comes with this double-edged sword, because as you try to deceive another, you also deceive yourself and it creates a, creates a cha chaotic effect in your psychology. It ca creates essentially what are called like people could call them fractures of self. And when you lie to somebody and you know you deceive them and they don't know you deceive them, you know you deceive them. And the fact that you know you deceive them creates a part of you that looks upon you as a deceiver. And then all of a sudden there becomes this, there, and if you keep doing that, the consequences are pretty bad. And, and people who have become perpetual liars, they live really shitty lives. Honestly, anybody who is a perpetual or compulsive liar, 
mm, their lives are very, very toxic, like very bad for them. Even if they have a lot of money and material success, they usually live in a kind of a, a kind of a hell, right? So, it, you know, first of all, don't do that to yourself. Don't, don't like try to, t it's better to tell your truth and your truth is going to come out of um, ugly. It's often going to be ugly to you. So if somebody hurt you, you know, y your opinion of that, your ugly opinion of that, I don't think you should necessarily go out and act in the world. But sometimes like if you write a letter to somebody, like I wrote a letter to my dad when I was younger, like I love my dad today. We don't really talk, but, uh, but I wrote a letter to him at one point. It was a really ugly letter. It was like, you're a piece of shit because of this. You're a piece of shit because of that. Just got it all out. I would never give him that letter. Even, no matter what, I'd never give him that letter because it's just fucking vile. It's, it's putrid and it's ugly and it's gross and I don't like it one bit. But it needed to come out of me. And I had all these ugly, dark, shadowy thoughts and just kind of like whatever and blamey and weak and victim-y garbage that had to come out of me. But the thing is, is that by getting it out of you, you, you in a sense, you, 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 can, you can clear you can clear the gunk out of the pipes of creativity, you know, because the, if the pipes are running gunk, you know, you, you, you got to let the gunk flow out because otherwise it will clog up all the, all the good stuff. Um, the, the other thing too is like when you're, when you're in your creative, when you're in your creative flow, you might not, when you're not in control, you might not like what comes out of you, but maybe what comes out of you is the gift, even if you like it or not. And I think that's a really important thing to recognize about the creative flow is that sometimes being in flow isn't always about something pretty coming out of you. It sometimes is about something ugly coming out of you. And that's just a part of the process of like clearing the gunk. And in, in, the, in the process of seeing the gunk come out of you is you can actually have a transformation in that very own, in your very own experience of seeing your own ugliness get shown to you. Like as you like purge it out of you through your art, you like begin to see, ugh, can't believe I did that. You know what I mean? And then that almost like disgust or recoil from yourself, right? But there's something in a way where that's, you know, there's something that we can respect about that because we can kind of go, well, that's, that's real, you know? And like, um, I'm trying to think of the, like this happens, you see this in movies and you see this in all sorts of stuff all the time. It's it, it, like, it's a part of the process, but I think like for somebody that maybe hasn't done a lot of creative stuff, they might think, Oh, like it, it's not all about feeling good. It's, it's sometimes it's about like letting something come out of you that hurts or something that's like ugly or something you don't necessarily like or something you don't understand. And as it comes out of you, like I imagine the literary, when they read that mini monologue scene, like whatever, cause it's not a full monologue, but there's a bit of dialogue. But the point is, is that they must've said, you know, it's inspired cause there must've been something about that that resonated with them. They must've been listening to that character going like, yeah, I kind of agree with, with, with what they're saying. Even though that character was kind of an asshole and kind of like saying some mean shit in certain ways you could say. But I think that sometimes we have these characters that are a little more shadowy and they say the thing that sometimes we want to say, but because they're, they're not trying to be good. They're not looking good. They, they, they get the permission that we often don't give ourselves. And I think creativity sometimes like the villain is an interesting part of storytelling because through the villain, sometimes you get to speak your shadow through your work and you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't act on it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't ever say it to anybody, but then you get to, you get to kind of express it through this character. And there's like, you, people almost applaud it and they give it permission. But at the same time, maybe that's healing for you, you know? So I do think that when you're not thinking and you're letting things flow out of you, sometimes that's what you need to heal. Because if you have this stuff that you refuse to heal, that you block, that you hide within, your thoughts are always going to try to keep you in survival mode, which I started this whole little soapbox about, which is that your, your mind is always going to avoid these vulnerable things you're avoiding. It's always going to try to find a way to get you to like dance around it. Like, Oh, I don't want to say that. I couldn't say that. I couldn't do that. It's like, but if you, if you get thought out of the way all of a sudden and you just let this stuff pour out and you don't worry what people think of you and you don't care about how you'll look 
all of a sudden something really truthful and interesting will come out of you. And you might not even understand it, you know? And like, here's another one last thought, Evan, I just have to share it, I guess, before I pass this on to you. So writing sometimes another character, like uh, in one of the scripts that I, I wrote, I've talked about this a few times in the podcast is um, Love Lost, it's called. Uh, one of the female characters, like, I'm not a woman. I don't know what it is to necessarily be a woman. I don't, I don't know. But the thing is, is she gave me a voice for some things that I can't say as a man. And it's a weird thing, man. It's like, it's like that because of who she was, because of how that character got kind of created and formed, she got to speak a truth that I haven't been able to speak. And it's not necessarily pretty truth. And she got to speak about shame and she got to speak about stuff that uh, it just, you know, you just don't get to talk about in certain ways. And I, I, I mean, her story isn't necessarily my story, but it is in a way, you know, and, and I've had people tell me when they read that script, like one person in particular said, you know, when they read that script at a certain point, they, they chucked the script across the room. And then half an hour later, they picked it up and read the rest of it. And that person has told me they've read the script twice more since then. Which is like, as a writer, I mean, it's what an honor. But the thing is, is like, yeah, because like sometimes this stuff, even the reader, even the person inducing it, just like, ugh, ugh. But it hits on something, right? And like, I don't know. All I'm saying is that I'm not saying it's the greatest script ever written because whatever, it's just irrelevant. But you know what the point is, is that there's some truth in there. And I think like ever since, uh, particularly ever since that script, I've always been trying to look at how do I, how do I just let the truth come out in this work? And I can tell you that it's like not by thinking it out. It's by, usually it's by feeling it. And with the feeling, you know, you don't have any thought. You just kind of let that character talk let them act, let them do what they need to do. And then you can, you can break it down later. You can look at it later and you, you know, it is what it is, but it's like, that's, that's part of it. So I think, um, unless you let yourself have that, I think you're always going to be kind of a, a breath away or at least a step away. And sometimes an arm length away or more from what you're actually truly capable of. And I think that that was only the tip of the iceberg for me. I think there's so much deeper of a well to go into but, you know, but, it, you know, it's an access point. And I can tell you one thing. There was not a lot of thinking when I was writing that script. And that's why I think people will read it. And, and that's why it's been such a positive review. And so, you know, it's, it's often, this is the last thing I'll say about this. It's often just me trying to get myself out of my own way. You know? Any, any last thoughts or beer? No, let's beer. Okay. Let's beer. So this one, I'm pretty sure we've had this one on before, but yeah. this this is from, who is this? I, th I thought this was like a red, oh, Central City. Yeah, this is from Central, Central City Brewing. And this is called their Beer League <laughs> Craft Brewed Lager. So yeah, I mean, it's a lager. It, it it it's everything that a logger's supposed to be, you know, and it's uh, nice, light, easy, nothing fancy, but it does uh, does the trick. Brandon, you got anything more to add to that? Not a lot, man. It's it's a nice light beer. It's been good. I don't. I think we may have had it. I don't really remember having it. I'll just give it a thumbs up. I mean, it's a good logger. It's good. That's what I gotta say. Loggers are always like that for me, though, across the board. I'm always like, okay. Like, like, I would say it's actually on the better end of loggers because I'm usually pretty much underwhelmed by most loggers these days. But um, yeah, so I'm just going to kind of say my last point again. I think what a lot of what we're talking about today, this is kind of a reminder for me, I suppose. And, and you know, if it helps anyone out there, that's great. I'd say it's just like, yeah, when there's no time for thinking, it's, 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 there's no time to get in your own way, you know, and, uh, a lot of the time you can't do something the way you want to do it because you're overthinking it. 
And when you just trust yourself, you begin to see that it there's you're 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 more there than you realize, you know. And um, uh, well, I give one example, uh, and, and I'll pass it on to you. One example is um with motorcycle riding, when you get past I think it's twenty kilometers, well fifteen at least, but twenty to twenty five kilometers, you have to counter steer, which means that you turn the bike the opposite direction to the way that it would go. It's a very weird concept at first. You're like, what do you mean? You turn the bike the other way, but it's just how it works. And when you think about it, you're like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, I, I, what do I do? I have to turn the wheel, the, like get out of your own way. You actually know how to do this already. You, you, what you don't realize is if you've ever ridden a bike, you've done anything, you already know how to do a lot of this shit. And the funny thing is, is the moment you start thinking about, wait, I need to, I need to counter steer. Like, like, and sometimes you'll, like, I'll run through a practice while I'm riding down the road. It's like, let me just practice my swerve. And I'll be like, wait, what's, what's the right way to swerve? And I start thinking about it. I like get in my head and I'm like, oh yeah. Like, but when I'm relaxed, you just naturally do it. You just naturally swerve out of the way. You just do what you need to do. You just, you totally got it. And the thing is, is that there's a nature inside of us, I think, where we naturally have a knowing of what stuff is and we know the right thing to do. But the moment you start trying to think about it and you start trying to go like, let me do the right thing you actually do the wrong thing because there are some things in life that your brain, like the moment it starts thinking about it, it second guesses it and then it fucks the whole thing up. So um, I think one of the things about this conversation, which is a reminder of me is that, man, like just remember you got this and that's where a lot of the confidence comes from is just, just you got it. And you know what? If you don't got it, then you'll find out pretty quick that you don't got it and then you'll get it. So don't worry about whether you got it or don't got it. You know what I mean? Like you probably got it. You know what I mean? And so there's kind of like, and that's where I think the confidence comes in is you just kind of got to go like, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. This is, this is okay. And if you do, if you have a process, one last thought, if you have a process already in place and a way, like you've already learned how to do it the right way, trust your process. Your process will probably be wired into you a lot deeper than your mind will try to work it out. So you have to just trust the fact that you kind of, you already know, like, okay, these are the right things to do. And if you start thinking about, wait, what are the right things to do? You're going to be all screwed up. So that was just the thought I had. I don't know, but I'll pass it on to you, my man. I remember, I don't know who said it, but I remember hearing these words good instincts will tell you what to do far be before your head's even begun to figure it out oh, yeah. and you know yeah it's it's i'll, I'll re reiterate this this point on that our intelligence goes far beyond far beyond just our thinking brain mm -hmm. far beyond that and and getting ourselves sort of back in touch with with that capacity that we have i think you know a big part of that is again get the attention off of yourself and trust your process like put put your attention into the process take the attention off of yourself there will be plenty of time and moments in your life where you can sit and really think and ponder about about things but i think to a large degree a lot of maybe what we the way that we've been talking about this has been sort of about like how do you get yourself going and creative and creating things you know it seems to be almost a way in which we've been speaking about this where it's you know thinking can really just block you you know from from getting going creatively and What's in, and, and taking the attention off of yourself in those moments where you're like, oh, I'm stuck, I'm blocked, I'm whatever, you know, it's like that, the, the default state that we have is to go and, to go and think more and go internally. And, and it very often just makes the whole situation worse. Or even if we, we try to give ourselves some sort of internal pep talk, I mean, I don't know about you, but most of the time that I've, I try to do that, it doesn't work. You know, it's like the, it's, 
it's uh what do they say it's like it's the 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 pot calling the kettle black kind of a thing like it's just it's the thing that's creating the problem is trying to solve the problem <laughs> and it's it's like it's it's not going to work but if we can just use our intelligence to a certain degree to say like look just direct yourself into this thing just put your attention on doing the thing that's right in front of you like what's happening right now right in front of you and just do that thing do it with your full attention without with with no distraction around it like do it fully and then do the next thing fully and the next thing fully put your attention into the process take the attention off of yourself and suddenly it's like the how again how you felt your whether you feel confident or not confident becomes an irrelevant point because you're you're doing the thing you're doing the thing and as we've discussed in this podcast it's like it, that that feeling on either side of it can be can both add something and can be uh very deceptive either way as well so being I guess in some ways creatively consistent is about staying focused on the process, right? Not getting in, in your way, not getting caught up in whatever the ego is, is telling you is going on, right? Because then you open up the floor for your full human intelligence to, to become alive and to become involved and, and, to really do something incredible. Thank you for listening in on our conversation today. We hope you found something helpful that you can carry forward with you. Head over to our website, wayoftheartist.com, for more free exclusive material and learn about the show. If you haven't already, please support us by subscribing to the show, sharing it with people you know, and keeping compassionate, creative conversation going.